Hi guys, we're going to get started in just a, a few moments. Um, start now. <laughs> okay, so I guess we'll just get started now. Um, I just wanted to first introduce myself. My name is Jessica Brinton, and I am the Media Relations Coordinator here at the Center for Global Development. If this is your first time here, welcome. Um, CGD, as many of you probably already know, we work on how policies of the rich world impact the poor world and how we can make those policies help poor folks all over the world improve their lives. So um, we today are, are working with the development, uh, the development Communicators Network, which I am a co-founder of, and there will be several other folks here today who will talk a little bit more about the network itself. Um, but we are very pleased to have David Rudman here with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce David in just a second, but first I'm going to actually have Zoe come up and give a little more information about the network just for a few moments, and then we'll introduce David. So Zoe, come on up. Hi, I'm Zoe, and I work at Interaction as the marketing coordinator. Um, we are one of the four founding members of the Deve Development Communicators Network, and the others are the Center for Global Development, the Connect US Fund, and the UN Foundation. Um, this is our blog, which you can find at devcom411.blogspot.com. We also have a, a project sharing uh, site, which do you think, well, which I'll show you how to get to really quick. Oops, I need the mouse too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so you can just uh, scroll down to the bottom <laughs> past all of our um, event summaries and join right here if you're not already a member. Um, we have uh, spaces to share documents for knowledge sharing, um, spaces to start discussions, event announcements, calendars, um, and it's just a great place for all of us to share information to make our jobs easier. Um, if you're interested in joining as part of the planning committee or um, just joining the network, you can talk to me or Jessica or Will or Carl. So that's it. <laughs> yep. Okay, cool. Okay, great. And thanks so much, Zoe, for showing us that. And we'll actually, maybe after uh, afterwards, we can actually pull up the platform and show where you guys can actually log in and show you kind of the whole platform afterwards if you guys are interested. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce David Rudman. Um, David is a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development. Um, right now, he currently focuses on microfinance issues, and he'll tell you a little bit more about how he got into microfinance. Um, he's also our Stata guru for those economists in the room, and he's also in charge of our Commitment to Development Index, which is one of the premier products that the Center for Global Development puts out every year since 2002. I believe. And basically, the, the index ranks how rich world countries and how kind of the influ influential and powerful are impacting development. And we kind of look at development not just as aid, but we look at it as trade, as investment, um, kind of a wide range of issues. And so I definitely recommend you guys checking out the index as well. Um, David, if you want to come up and talk about um, basically your book and your blog and how you kind of got that all started. So come on up. This is a little awkward to do from here. Oh, you want to just do it? Okay. Um, I conceive of this as a rather informal talk, which is another way of saying I didn't plan it very well. Um, so I hope that you guys will ask really good questions, which will give me second and third chances to tell you the things I forgot to plan to say. Um, so um, I, should, I want to start off by just commenting on the title of this talk. Uh, let me find a flyer here. How to create a unique online communication strategy. Um, I, I caught when I when I saw this, I caught in the word strategy because I don't really feel like we had a strategy. This is something that we, we invented as we went, um, and it's very much a function, as I'll discuss, of what I like to do with who I am. Uh, maybe in that sense, there's a strategy. We have to figure out what we're good at. Um, I started in this business, the think tank business, uh, 19 years ago almost. And I did it, if the shades were open, you could see the building where I did it, 1776 Massachusetts. I was uh, almost 25. 
Um, I was at a place called the World Watch Institute, which is still there, which is, uh, mostly works on environmental issues. And its style is to um, do broad synthetic pieces on global warming or deforestation or renewable energy that are written for a general audience. Uh, and there are, I don't think there have ever been PhDs on staff, and I certainly wasn't one at the time. It's, it's about being interdisciplinary in your approach, being smart, but also oriented towards communication. And that suited me, and um, I guess strengthened the propensities that I have to work in that way. Um, and so the, the style that I've become increasingly comfortable with over time is, but it's true to who I am, is I like to dig deep into a subject. Uh, in this case, it's about whether microfinance works. Uh, other times, it's, it's quite mathematical, like do we have proof that foreign aid raises economic growth, statistically speaking. And I dig very deep, sometimes I get obsessed with the data, sometimes and the numbers, sometimes I get obsessed with the history. And then I come out and I like to share what I have figured out with the general audience. And that's really, that, that, those, that propensity is really central to how this blog played out, I think. Um, I started here just under 10 years ago. Uh, the center itself is almost exactly 10 years old, 10 years and two weeks, something like that. Uh, and about four years ago, maybe slightly longer, I began working on the subject of microfinance. And the idea was to do what I thought of as World Watch style work here at CGD, where it's a little bit less common. Um, sort of take on this big subject of microfinance, deal with the hype and the evidence, and try to figure out, well, what is it good for? Um, and then share what I figured out after having dug deep. Um, around you know, chapter three or four, I guess it was. Uh, I wanted to have a chapter, I guess it was probably three at that point. It sort of surveyed the current landscape of microfinance, described the different types, you know, do a, a landscape by the numbers, how many loans were outstanding, what were the dollar amounts involved, give you be oriented. And I thought, well, I should have had a section right at the beginning just um, covering the history, because I knew that actually there were historical roots to microfinance going back some time. And as I started digging into the history uh, using this wonderful thing called Google Books, in which makes it easier to read 200 year old books than 20 year old books. Um, I started getting obsessed in this way that I did and discovered all these instances of financial services being brought in mass, en masse to poor people, um, some going back 500 years. And I got really excited about this and couldn't explain why, but really felt compelled to write about this. And so I wrote a chapter just on that. That section expanded into a whole chapter. And when I had a draft, I thought, you know what, there must be a lot here I don't know about. You know, instances in China or Japan or what have you. I, I, this is what I found so far through my searching, but there must be more I don't know. Too bad I can't share this online. You know? And that is where the idea came from. And I don't even actually remember exactly if it was me or Lawrence McDonald or, or the VP for was it, communication and from policy. Um, but we were talking about this and um, we thought, well, you know, why don't you just we hit upon the idea of, of sharing the chapter graphs in public. And at the point I guess I had three or four. Um, so Lawrence had the very good idea of going to one of his gurus on online communication, who was Dave Witzel. I don't know if he's familiar to any of you here at the time. I think he had just left Form 1 Communications, which is our main um, web design you know, provider, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, and he was at the, at the time, and now I think he was in environmental defense. I'm not sure if he is still there. Um, he's somebody who was really interested in the cutting edge of communication. He's the one who first told us about Twitter. It was called microblogging, and it was a time when almost no one had heard of it. Um, and so we had lunch with him over at Zorba's, and he said, you need to share everything. Do everything online. You read something interesting, post that. Um, you know, you have a thought, share that. You got a question, share that. And it was really from there that we decided to create a full-fledged blog. Uh, and that, that was post, that started, I think, in February, coming up on three years ago. So that would have been 2009. And then about six months later, I, I put my toe in the water on Twitter and became the first person here to do that, not quite understanding what it was, but, you know, of course, eventually getting the hang of it. I remember the first time I got retweeted, I think it was by um, Bill Easterly. I thought, wow, that's really cool. I've never seen that before. Um, so I, I led the way on that here at the organization. Um, but again, it was all just experimental and incremental just to see what would work. Um, what I found is that almost as soon as the blog started, I felt a certain burden to produce content beyond just posting graph chapters. Uh, I mean, the, the original idea, just to backtrack a little bit, was I realized that you know once we started thinking about Dave Whistle's advice, um, that 
traditional way that one writes a book, which is you you know you scribble in obscurity for a year or so, uh, and then once you've got your grand opus finished and frozen, you, you put it out in public, and then get the reaction when it's too late to change it. It seemed very stilted and you know unnecessarily rigid and uncommunicative in the age we're now in. So I thought, well, why can't I share this process online and get more immediate back and forth? Um, so while that was the germ, the fact was we didn't. I just post a chapter a day, you know. <laughs> Most days there was no new actual book content to track, to post, and yet I felt a certain burden as one does and one blogs to provide content. And so, pretty quickly, I found myself moving into the role of being, you know, sort of a typical blogger who has a certain idea space that he follows and tries to keep up on. And through that process, gets into a positive cycle of sharing content, getting more readership, being someone who people bring content to, and so on. Um, and I, I very much enjoy that. I mean. Uh, you know, it, it was an opportunity in part for me to um, play with a new writing voice, uh, also to cover stuff that I wouldn't be able to cover in the book in a, in a more informal way. Um, so there are different kinds of posts that I've put up. Uh, I, I tend to, right now, I'm probably averaging once every week or so. Uh, there were times when I was blogging almost daily. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, um, Sometimes I do, uh, you know, sort of with what do they call it, the quote and, quote and link logs. You know, you're just saying cool thing I read. Here's a quote link. I don't tend to do too much of that. And maybe I should do more. Um, it, my my reticence about that is partly that I just feel like we're all overwhelmed with distractions, and I don't really feel like I want to get in the business of being yet another distract feed for distractions. Um, so something has to really excite me and, and teach me something before I will. Go through, go through the work of, of putting it up on the blog. Um, more common is for me to share uh, my thinking aloud, especially when I was writing the book. You know, I'm puzzled. An early post was about it was called "To Fee or Not to Fee," and it was about this question of when is an interest rate too high? When is when is a high interest rate usury? And you know, or are there other ways of defining justice? And when I was talking about lending that, have, that don't have to do with the price. So that's something I was really struggling with and eventually led to some writing in the book. And there were other posts like that where I played with ideas like, can we have a, a micro-deposit insurance fund set up? And I posted several times on that, and the smart commentators on there eventually persuaded me that it wouldn't work, and so it didn't make it into the book. Um, and the other kind of post that began to develop, because probably because of my good timing in a sense, um, was that I, I was tracking, tracking current events in, my, in the field of microfinance. As it happened, uh, starting really a few months after I began blogging in mid-2009, it became a very newsworthy time in microfinance. There were the first randomized trials of the impact of microcredit, which showed, just did not find, these over short time horizons, any impact of microcredit reducing poverty. And that was a big challenge to the mythology of microfinance and to the movement. Uh, and then in, over the next couple of years, we had several bubbles develop and then pop, and especially there was a crisis in India, which you probably heard about, or suicide stories in the press. Uh, and the government in the state of Andhra Pradesh really cracked down, pretty much destroyed the industry there. Um, and then there was the removal of Muhammad Yunus, which itself was triggered, um, although I don't really think caused, by the release of a, a kind of a muckraking documentary. Um, so there's a lot going on, and I um, consciously tried to position myself as a go-to authority on these matters, and the way I did that was by keeping up. So there are some kind of posts that I did, especially on the Eunice affair, where I just sort of reporting latest results. This sort of signal to reporters who I had in mind, you know, I'm following this stuff, and maybe you want to talk to me. And that worked, you know. Uh, what I was doing wasn't in itself newsworthy, but I was I was surfing on the news that was out there, and so I was in the New York Times several times, and uh, NPR, and BBC, and so on. Um, so doing this, going through this process, has had a number of effects. Well, maybe one more thought. Sorry, I just missed the point in my outline. Um, now that my book is done, it was officially, my access to it was officially cut off yesterday. <laughs> I can no longer change it. It should be printed later this month. Um, but, but the creative active writing stopped this summer, really. Um, now that it's done, I have struggled to um, provide content. And still felt a certain sense that you know, if I don't keep providing content, then people will stop coming, which may really have happened to some extent. Um, and so it has left me a little bit uncertain about how to sustain this, whether to sustain this. I expect to stop working on microfinance, you know, after the initial sort of 
push the release of the book is over and move on to something else. I very much like this, this, this form of work, um, but uh, I won't be tracking microfinance. And yet at the same time, I have a certain, I'm, I'm afraid of losing, losing my audience, even though inevitably I must lose some of them. Um, and so I'm going to just be struggling with that and figure out how to move forward uh, as, as, I, as I move beyond this book. Um, so here's, here's some effects that I listed for me. And for, uh, one is, as I mentioned, is that it allowed me to do stuff on the blog that I never would have been able to do for the book. And in some cases, it was a good thing that I didn't ask for permission. I just went ahead and did. And this is my most um, you know, famous post. This is really the breakout one. This, this I did about um, whatever it would have been, uh, uh, eight months into the blog. Um, and it's just a post about a subtle thing. There's a popular person-to-person -person, uh, microcredit website called Kiva, where you can go and choose who you want to make loans to. And you see pictures and stories. And, and I read somewhere, I didn't even figure this out myself, that in fact the people you saw on the screen had already gotten their loans. And that your money was actually going to other people who weren't on the site. site. And so there was this kind of an illusion that was being created. If you read carefully, you, you, there was disclosure there. But I had an idea that most people using the site didn't realize what was actually happening. And that just kind of bothered me a bit. It wasn't that I thought it was the end of the world. In fact, I thought that what Kiva was doing was efficient. But it seems that something interesting to think about it, and it hooked to the larger theme of the role of rhetoric, the rhetoric versus reality in microfinance. So I wrote this long post, just as I wrote it, sort of ex expanded. And it's like four or 5,000 words. And, you know, it took three or four days of my time. And if I had gone to Nancy Burns all here and said, I'd like to spend four days writing about this illusion on Kiva.com, or Kiva.org, she said, no way. <laughs> but I felt compelled, and fortunately around here we have a fair amount of latitude, and I did it. And it, it, it was one of these things that, that went viral because I was tweaking a very popular thing. Um, and perhaps the style in which I did it, which was fairly gentle, was also appreciated as part of the effect. Um, and so that led to um, a New York Times story about a month later, precisely on what I had raised. And that, that usually raised my profile within microfinance. Um, I was no longer just somebody scribbling in obscurity, working on a book I was now coming to be seen as a leading intellectual in this field, at least in the West. Um, and so that's really been great to have that profile um, built before the book even comes out. I don't know if you, if you picked up, we have a little flyer for the book itself. And you'll see there's a cover on there, but then there's also a bunch of quotes, which I'm very happy with. There's quotes from Muhammad Yunus and Tim Hartford and, and other notable people. Uh, there's no question that most of those quotes could not have been attained or obtained if, if I hadn't built my public profile this way before the book came out. And that's some, sort of one measure of how this has worked. Um, another interesting thing, uh, I don't know if this generalizes much, but the blog allowed me to sort of get a little bit more control over how my work was used. Uh, a year and a half ago, actually almost two years ago, a documentary maker, a guy, a documentary I've already mentioned actually, named Tom Heinemann, who was a Danish, approached me and said he was making a film about microcredit. And it was pretty clear he was looking for the dirt. You know, he wanted to do a kind of muckraking story. And to some extent I felt in alliance with him because I was also wondering what Grameen Bank was hiding and what the truth is. And, but I could also tell that he was really going for one side and was going for a you know, sort of powerful video effect, you know, getting women crying and, you know, getting attention that way. Um, so I agreed to be interviewed by him. Uh, some people, some other, you know, notable intellectuals that I was talking with decided not to. I decided to go along with it. And he uh, obtained permission from me to use three quotes, one of which was positive and two which were negative. The actual the first version of the documentary came out only had the negative ones in it. Um, but then I was able to uh, plot the documentary once it was out. And I think, I guess it's here. You know, this is, we call it the microcredit attack documentary. And I've got the screenshot of me, so I'm, I'm sort of signaling, I'm, you know, I'm part of the story. But I also got my own opinion. Um, and I was able to sort of offer my comments and tell the story of how I'd been brought into this and say that I had some quotes that I approved that weren't used and so on. And I think this got, I would say, you know, I don't know for sure, but probably some reasonable fraction of the people who have seen the documentary. It's not that easy to find, actually. Um, I probably also read this. Uh, and so that's been an interesting process. Uh, then the Grameen Foundation, which, which took on the role of responding to this, also interviewed me and put that on YouTube so they could get the other side of the story. And then, of course, I blogged that, too. So I have a post called Being Crossfire. Right? 
But there's sort of an interesting dynamic that developed where you can be part of the, the, the dialogue, but also encircling it, and, you know, uh, or at least being part, part of it. I think that's all really interesting. Um, another thing it did was it slowed the book down. This book has taken forever, and I'm not proud of that. Uh, you know, I said I was starting to write this three years ago, but three years ago I already had several chapters, and I just finally finalized it, you know, this, this week. Um, I, certain people I work for are not entirely happy with how long that took, uh, and I don't, I can't argue with that, just that, that uh, frustration. Um, but, uh, you know, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is, uh, on any given day, I preferred to blog than write a book. I just found it much easier. <laughs> and that's a point that I'll come back to. Uh, you know, just much more, it's just, it's, just a, it's an easier form of writing, and that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, another was that as all these new stories developed, I felt a certain compulsion to try to stay on top of them for the reasons I've already given. And so that really did take a substantial amount of time. The point is just there is a real opportunity cost here. It's not like I just did this in, you know, 5% of my time and exploited what I was already doing. It really does take work. Um, another point, and I mentioned this, is that it really made me think about writing voice. I don't know what the upshot of this is, but I was really struck by how um, natural it was for me, anyway, to blog and how much harder it was to write the book. And, and yet people seem to like the blog, so why was I working so hard to labor on this other style of prose that the blog prose was working? Should books be written like blog? So I want to read to you from a post that I did on the first anniversary of the blog that talks about this. There's a couple paragraphs. When I was 13, a great teacher I had would give me half an hour each day to fill, out, uh, fill a page on some topic that she would announce on the spot, such as sight or happiness, just to write a page. I think she helped me learn how to reflect onto paper, to articulate whatever was on the top of my mind, even if it was, I don't know what to write, and then discover the thought beyond that. Then I, when I was 16, I fell hard for a girl. Um, the relationship was not, uh, shall we say, symmetric. Um, she liked me okay. And actually, she's, she's still, I'm still friends with her today. Um, I, I know now that it was really true love for me. Um, but she went to another school, so I didn't see her much. So I began to write her letters in tight, uh, penciled cursive on blue-lined paper, sitting in classes for which I'd already done the work. I wrote news, thoughts, love. To my surprise, the flow of words never stopped. The last some years ago, she trashed all the love letters. <laughs> um, uh, I feel a continuity between that young man and this blogger 25 years later. The sense that I am rediscovering a writing voice has made blogging especially meaningful for me. And to see that other people appreciate this voice, at least in small doses, is gratifying. But I also try to make my his t also, but I also try to take my history as a warning. Romantic love is in part self-love, and in my years in Washington, I've observed how external validation can lead one to fall in love with one's own voice, or lose perspective and judgment. So please tell me if you think I'm very that way in this blog. And there's another section I'll skip, and then I wrote at the end of the post, when I work on the book, I feel like I'm making a speech. When I blog, I feel like I'm writing a letter. And I don't have a full answer on that, but I, do, I you know, I've actually been provided in the post, I provided two passages. One was the blog version and one was the book version. And Lawrence McDonald, our communications director, said, well, I, was, it was, I found the book version easier to understand. So maybe there actually is something to that extra effort to really say what you want concisely. Um, but I still do wonder whether I should try to push towards a more informal voice in book writing and in other similar kinds of writing. There's no question that I did begin to do that as a result of the blog. And in fact, I think there's a subtle inconsistency. I don't know if anybody can sense it besides me. When you go through the book, there's some places where I'm a little bit more personal and a little bit more willing to use I, and that reflects the fact that I was experimenting with these things. I still haven't quite settled on this. Um, but I, it makes me feel very strongly that even in technical writing, um, in formal analysis of major policy issues, human beings are reading this stuff, and they re relate to individuals. And in appropriately careful, appropriate doses, it's, I think it's actually good to reveal your own individuality in order to connect. Um, to wrap up, let me just offer a few lessons. Uh, some of these probably will repeat things I've already said. 
Um, it helped that here at CGD we're not concerned about book revenues, sales revenues. We want sales, but we're not concerned about the money. So we were never worried that by you know putting the drafts online we would undercut revenue. Now, some have argued, and there are no randomized tests of this, that actually putting stuff out for free will boost your sales. But that is that argument is what it is. We didn't have to worry about it. Um, another point, just to emphasize, if you're thinking about how to emulate this, um, is just to say, remind people that blogging is a form of writing, and that means, you know, assuming you want to do more than sharing links and gossip, um, you need to do all the things that a writer does. You need to think about sentence structure and being clear and getting to the point and um, remembering that your audience only has limited time and is just li looking for an excuse to click that close button. You know, you have to do all the things that you do in any other kind of writing. And if that's not something that you love to do, you're probably not going to be a good blogger and you shouldn't try. Right? It's just about blogging, just like deciding how to blog, deciding whether to blog is a, is a kind of personal decision. You have to do it in a way that reflects who you are. Um, so in a sense, you can't do what I did unless you're like me. But maybe you can do it in your way. Um, and, and last of all, I guess I've already said this, is a serious commitment of time, and uh, so you need to think about that cost and the long run sustainability of making this kind of commitment. I'm not certain, even now, that I, that I will sustain this. I'm hopeful about it, but uh, I do sometimes feel the burden. Meanwhile, we do have some good group blogs here, which get, much, you know, get higher traffic and um, seem to be doing quite well, and don't place that burden on any individual here, while giving a lot of the benefits of blogging, like developing an audience. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. David, thanks so much. Okay. David, thanks so much, and I hope that was really helpful to everyone in the room. I know that the audience is somewhat split between communicators and also folks that are interested in microfinance. So I'm interested to hear the types of questions that will come up. Um, I just kind of have a first question for you, David, and that is you talked a lot about how this blog was kind of built around microfinance and your interest in that issue. I guess, do you have any ideas for where your blog and, and where kind of your audience as a, you know, as a development person and, and where that's going to go in the future, I guess? Well, it'll go, I finally remember to turn on my mic, so yeah. this, is, this has serious implications for the webcast, I'm yeah, afraid to say. It's okay. should have said something. So you guys kind of got an exclusive. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> um, do I need this? Should I should leave it on? Yeah, it feels good. strange. Uh, it depends on what I do next. And I haven't fully figured that out. It's, it's mo what is looking most likely is that I will work on climate. Um, we do have a bunch of work here already on climate, but we don't have somebody who's uh, resident 100% of the time who can sort of anchor that work. And it is something that I care about and have worked on in the past. Um, the reason I hesitate is I think I do my best when there are, I feel like there's some kind of big idea puzzle to be wrestled with. In the case of microfinance, it was trying to understand what do we really know about the impact? How do we reconcile the microenterprise um, salvation story with the over-indebtedness story? I'm not sure yet what the comparable thing would be with, client as, uh, with climate, as important as that is. Right, that's great. Um, and I can open the floor up to, to everyone, so if anyone has questions, I can pass this around. And we just have the mic because that way you can work with them. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Goldstein from Intermedia, and I have both communication and financial access uh, interests, uh, but I'll start with the communication side. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I can't remember the name of the development blog at the moment, but it, it shut down. It was very popular, and it shut down earlier this year. I don't Aid know. Aid Watch? Billy's Aid Watch, yeah. 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 Um, and, and it created a lot of shock, um, but, but it, it went its way. Um, so I think, you know, given that there's so many outlets out there, um, I'm just wondering, is another alternative just becoming a contributor to another blog or, or something like that, where you keep your voice, but you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, produce as much as you do for your, for your own blog, um, because there's a lot of outlets out there. Um, also, I, if I could follow up on the financial access side, I'm just curious what your impression is uh, off subject here. Um, you know, what, given all these events that happened in the, in the financial assets realm uh, a year or two ago, um, sort of what's the latest uh, view, if you will, on, on where, the, where the sector is going? Thanks. Okay. Um, on the first question, that's a great idea, something I hadn't thought of. I think our preference here, which would not be an iron rule, would be to have people 
who work here blog on our own blogs, be our, use our own group blogs. Uh, just because there are certain side benefits. You know, when you put up content, if it's embedded in your own web page, then you have chances to show people other relevant stuff and keep them at your site and show your other work. Uh, but we have a massive exception right now that Owen Barter is a senior fellow here, but he has his own separate identity, and that's, we're not, you know, it's not a serious issue. Um, so I'll keep that in mind. Depends, I suppose, on what I decide to work on. Uh, this, the state of the industry. Um, you know, you know, it's, it, the microfinance has faced a lot of challenges, obviously. You know, to some extent, the industry is different in each country, and it's in a different place, and so you can't generalize too much. But then there is sort of a global community that's struggling with these, these, these uh, the, the issues. Um, I think it's unfortunate, particularly in Indo India, the way that the, the industry has just been so shut down. At the same time, long run, I think the industry will survive. It always has survived crises like this before, and presumably wiser for the experience. Uh, um, my impression so far is that potential funders, whether they be Kiva users or big don dollar donors, are not running away from the sector. That would have been the greatest fear from the point of view of people in it. So it could be a relatively good outcome, and I think people are getting used to the idea that we need to have realistic expe expectations, and we can be honest about that. And realistic expectations are not that it lifts people out of poverty, but it provides useful services and builds interesting industries. I think people are getting better at talking about that and more comfortable, uh, maybe out of necessity, because the hype is no longer so credible. And that should be healthy going forward. Hi. Um, my name's uh, uh, Chris Neal. I'm uh, the Senior Communications Officer for the Energy uh, Department at the World Bank. And uh, I'm, I found your presentation very interesting. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, if I could just offer a few thoughts before my question. Um, it, it, while I was listening to you, I was thinking of, uh, of uh, one of my heroes as a journalist, is uh, George Orwell. And uh, you know, the, you know, I don't know if anybody's read the book Homage to Catalonia. It's uh, interesting because he really has a combination of the kind of personal voice and the professional book writing mm -hmm. voice. And uh, he, at the beginning of his book, he has like every ch every other chapter is him in the Spanish Civil War and what he went through, sitting in the trenches and you know uh, trying to get something to eat and uh, dealing with you know get, avoiding getting killed and so on. And then every other chapter is uh, the politics, what's going on, the Trotskyists, the communists, the uh, the socialists, the uh, the Basques, then and so on. It's, it, and he said he says right at the beginning, if you don't want to read the politics, just skip every other chapter. <laughs> And I, I thought, in a sense, it's kind of like blogging. You've got a book, you've got the formal presentation that you were doing, and then you've got the, the, the informal blogging on the side. And it occurred to me, kind of, well, what's your purpose in doing one or the other? And I guess ultimately your purpose, although you didn't spell it out, is to gain an audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do. If, if we're blogging or writing, presumably that's we right. want somebody to read us. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you'll reach some people through the blog, you'll reach other people through the book, is my my feeling, and, and sometimes you want books and sometimes you want blogs. It depends how you feel and what you're looking for, I suppose. But uh, both are useful. Um, it's, I, I'm just trying to think of how I would apply this to my particular challenge, which is to uh, promote, explain, explain, promote, and defend what the bank, the World Bank is doing in the energy sector. And uh, I'm facing a very polarized audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got uh, oil, gas, and mining types, and we've got uh, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, uh, Friends of the Earth. On the other side, so, and and we're in both camps. I mean, we're we're. we're I mean, we're not in camp. They're not camps. We're just we, we have to respond to a country that wants to have money to set up a, a coal-fired power plant, or uh, and we have to uh, uh, deal with uh, you know windmills and and uh, energy efficiency and all the rest of it. So it's uh, uh, it. I, I think a blog might be an interesting way to deal with it. And uh, what strikes me in what you're saying is that one way, and perhaps I'm ans answering my own question, but I'd like to. Forgive me for going on for a bit, but That's okay. uh, I, I wonder if uh, if you have some thoughts on dealing with that, because then when you dealt with the microfinance sector, you're dealing with every area is polarized in some way with different opinions. And what I think a lot of people are looking for is an independent voice that's mm -hmm. credible, that, that is authoritative, that, that uh, and at the same time it's fun to read. And I, I think that, uh, you know, if you, it sounds like you've achieved that. And uh, I just wonder if you had any thoughts on... on how one would approach uh, establishing a, a, uh, 
a credible voice in, in an area that has many opinions in it. I, I think that's really the challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and then I guess I would suggest to you that you've already got an audience in microfinance. If you wanted to keep it, to try to bridge to the next thing you're interested mm -hmm. in, to kind of gradually transition. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I haven't been in the trenches the way George R. Borwell was. <laughs> um, uh, but that's a, it's an interesting comparison. Um, well, I think you're, you, you've put your finger on something that I didn't make explicit. I, I do think it, it's true that part of the value that I added was, was being sincerely someone who was trying to hear out all sides and figure out what people had, everybody had to offer, in the general belief that almost everybody has some insight to offer, and then synthesize that. But then also at some point call them like I see them. Um, and I was able to do that because of my position here. I have a lot of independence. And it also reflects my kind of analytical style. You know, at, at the very end of my book, I, I talk about, um, uh, you know, I can't endorse microcredit when, when there are s credible stories of how people have gotten in trouble with it. I just can't endorse pushing money into it. On the other hand, I can't dismiss the idea that we all need credit. And, you know, so I, I got to listen to both sides. And I, I talk about how I'm the child of divorced parents um, and bitterly divorced parents and how that may shape my analytical approach for, for better and worse. <laughs> um, so at any rate, that, that's, that's, that, that, in a sense, it's, again, it's about discovering what I have to offer through my uniqueness, which we all have, and, make, and uh, going with that, and in that, in that way discovering a strength. It seems to me it would be harder to do that as a spokesperson for the World Bank, you know, sort of, sort of position yourself as someone who's thoughtfully listening to all sides. And, you know, to be, to be credible as an independent, you also have to um, be ready to call them like you see them sometimes, right? You can't always just be in the middle ground and hearing out all sides. You have to have opinions, too. People want to benefit from your thinking. Uh, so it seems like that would be hard from where you are now. If you left the bank and did it independently, then it might be <laughs> a lot easier. But that gets to the problem of business model, which is not a trivial one. This does not pay for itself very well. Yeah. And I think that was an option, too, is, um, is take a couple of questions and then let, my, uh, let David actually kind of answer a okay. few at a time. Um, but I actually did have one question before we pass it off, and that's a lot of the folks in this room are trying to get their senior fellows to do what you're doing, right? To, to tweet and to be online, to blog. What is your advice to us as folks trying to get someone like you to do it? How do we get folks to not only want to blog, but how to also find that voice that you talked about a lot? Um, and then we can, anyone else have questions? We can go take a couple. Hi, my name is Oscar Bello, and uh, I work at the Results for Development Institute. And I um, just want to say, David, I've been following you for since the beginning, and it's been fascinating and very enjoyable. And I'm very glad to see the book finally coming out. Um, so gushing aside, uh, one of the thoughts I've been... I work in... I am just joined R4D in September, and I'm doing communications for them. And one of the things I've been bouncing around to some of my coworkers, and maybe others can can, can uh, say something to this, is uh, having that longer piece, like a book, out there as an end product or as a as a sort of pillar or a tent pole, can be helpful for attracting engagement in other venues. Even if no one's going, even if those folks aren't going to read the book, the fact that there's a book out there as a as an end product makes everyone feel like they can contribute and be a part of that process to make something great. Do you think that's replicable, for, that model is replicable for something that maybe isn't as long as a book, but uh, is longer than a blog, like working papers or case studies that people are putting together? Um, writing it in an open format and inviting commentary and feedback as you're going along, um, is that something that uh, CGD is considering or have others considered doing that as part of their various content production uh, schemes. Interesting question. Um, you, want, you want to take more questions, or you got two so far? Question, no, go ahead. Okay. 
Um, I was wondering if you could comment quickly on how you, uh, if and how you used kind of comments and creating a discussion through your blog. Um, I think you mentioned how it really helped you organize your thoughts and, and put your thoughts out there, but I'm wondering um, how much you were able to get back from your readers and um, how that might have helped the process. Yeah. Okay. Advice on getting other others, including other fellows, to do this. Um, it isn't for everybody, as I think I kind of said. You have to be someone who cares about writing. Um, if, if you know writing, f maybe you only want to reach a technical audience, and you can write technically. I think there are a lot of economists who blog just for each other, and that's fine. Uh, but it, as I as I think about my colleagues here, I don't. I would not recommend this for most of them. Um, some could definitely do it. Uh, but maybe you don't want to make the, the commitment to having your own, maintaining your own feed, and, and so for them, working within our group blog is, is just fine. The others who I think just don't love and care about the writing in that kind of way, and so they, they do good work of other kinds. So I'm not sure I have a lot of great advice except to recognize that you can't just make people do it. There are a lot of instances where an organization of people who do, they don't write, they do, you know, um, decides, well, we need to have a blog so that we can connect with the people out there. And, and then it doesn't work because people just, people on the staff are not, don't wake up every day saying, I want to share my thoughts with the world. It's just not what they live for. And you can't force that too much. Um, do you have shorter pieces? I think it could work. The, the big challenge, I think, is that it takes time to build up an audience. Uh, and so you, what you might have to commit to is having a single feed for all of your short projects. And so then people can commit themselves by subscribing to that feed or visiting that page um, and, and knowing that they'll get different projects at different times. I don't know. You know, you guys, honestly, I don't read blogs that much. Um, so you guys probably have more experience but with the decision process you go through when you decide whether to stick with one or not um, and what makes you decide to do so. I would guess is that one is that you think of it as a kind of a long-term commitment. You know, this is somebody who's going to be around for a while I want to think about for a long run. And if they're only going to be around for a month or so, maybe it's not worth bothering. Just a guess about how people might think about it. Uh, comments. That's interesting. Um, you know, the, the premise, you might even say the artifice of this blog was we're going to put up draft chapters and get comments and it'll be a sort of a, almost like a crowdsourcing kind of book writing process. I got almost no comments on the draft chapters <laughs> in, in over three years, so just almost none. And I wasn't actually that surprised based on earlier experiences I had had. Uh, people are busy. You know, it's not, it's not that surprising. Um, there were a couple. There were people who actually went through and gave me thoughts, and that was helpful. Um, where I think it did help is when I was airing certain ideas. Uh, I gave one example of playing with this deposit insurance idea, and there were others. Uh, I really did get feedback that forced me to think more carefully and affected what was in the book. And just more generally, in a way I can't define that precisely, it gave me a sense of audience, a sense of how people were reacting, what they found interesting, um, which I think did influence the book. Um, I did have one follow-up question, and that's, yeah. you're very popular on social media as well, particularly on Twitter, and you kind of developed that as you were doing the, the open book blog. Can you mm. talk a little bit about how social media helped or maybe didn't help you with the book and with the blog? Oh, I mean, I use Twitter. That's, I, for me, I, I've segmented, so Twitter is professional, Facebook is personal. Um, and I, I, I'm on Google+, Plus, and there, what's nice about that is you can control your identity to different audiences. Um, I think I have a lot to say about that. I, you know, I have... Um, I mean, one thing I should just mention as a, as a, as a sort of uh, mechanical thing, what I do do is, is I use Twitter to document things that I th think are interesting that I've read. Um, but that I don't want to go through the trouble of doing a quote and, and link post for, for reasons I've already discussed. And then we've got a little plug-in in our blog that compiles my tweets each week and turns them into a post. Uh, I don't know if that's, cons if that's popular or if people hate that, I don't know. But it's a way of, for me of compiling um, things I've, I've, I've interested in recommend to others without making big production of it. Uh, this is a case where I, I've played struggled myself with the margins of what I should do. Um, some of my colleagues, mo I would say that most of my colleagues who are on Twitter tweet more than I do. They tweet everything they think is interesting that they've read. I have, t in a sense, typecast myself. Mostly I tweet news that I get about microfinance. Um, I'm not sure I can fully explain that, except it's kind of like what I said before about the, the quote and link tweets. I, I'm, I'm, I feel a bit reticent about putting too much out. 
And I don't know if that's a good call or not. Any other questions? How big is your audience? Uh, on Twitter, I think I'm about 3,600 followers. Um, the uh, blog gets between one and 2,000 visitors a week. Some substantial percentage of that. Oh, that's what I was going to show you um, for what it's worth. Uh, if I take Google this, you bet it is. I'm not signed in now. doesn't know who I am. You can see what comes up first. Um, I don't think Kiva does that. But if, I, if you Google Kiva, there's a lot of words. If you, any phrase that has Kiva in, you know. The point is, um, Google sends me a lot of traffic because of that one post that I did and because of the amount of times it got linked to. So a third, maybe more, of the traffic to my blog is that one post. And it's because of the, the Google rank that it gets. Um, so I'm not sure if you take that out with the, <laughs> with the audience. That is every month, pretty much, I think, the most popular blog post on the CGD site. And it's because of this. So I, mean, I should say, I don't, I don't think of that as a large audience. I think of it as, as a, except within the niche world of microfinance. It's respectable. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious as you were going along, because um, we've talked about comments and what have you, were you thinking while you were doing the blog in a certain way of whether or not it was being a success or not? Like, did you have metrics in your mind uh, of whether you thought it was working or not working at any certain times? Um, mostly not. Yeah. I don't think. I you mean, just did it. <laughs> I certainly didn't. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I, you know, when you write something, what you most want to know is whether it's good or not. And you judge that by whether people comment on it or whether it gets linked to. Uh, and so that's most thing, that was what was mostly on my mind. Um, this Twitter thing is kind of a one-off thing. Could, I mean, the Kiva thing, it could easily have not happened, and then I would have had a different profile. I was not expecting it to turn out the way it did, which was really pushing me myself as a leading commentator in this field. I wasn't expecting that. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I just had like a, a brain talk of that is Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I should have talked about that. Thank you. It's one of those things I forgot to say. Um, I forget who is it. It might have been Dave Witzel. Somebody advised us um, to promote the blog. I should go to where the people are. In my case, that's other people working on microfinance, and they do congregate online in certain places. There are a couple of email discussion lists. Those are the main things. So what I did is, um, not always, but in some of my more substantial posts, I would send them to these email groups saying, comments, welcome, sort of, you know, very low-key, um, appreciate your comments on this, here's the link, but also include the full text. Uh, and I, I, I stopped doing that, maybe I should keep doing it, but that was a conscious effort to do some outreach around this. I don't know that we did much else, maybe because we couldn't think of what else to do, but word spread. I can add a little to that. Um, yeah. when, when David started to kind of get some of those initial media hits, we yeah. did then kind of do kind of a concentrated media push around his uh. blog. So what we did is we'd actually send some of the more popular blogs to folks who were covering microfinance, were covering the regions where those particular issues were happening, or we'd also just kind of reach out to new people and say, hey, I don't know if you know about David. He's doing this really interesting thing on microfinance. Have you heard about it? You know, and so we did a lot of kind of push around those, but it was kind of built off of things we already knew were interesting to people. So we use that as kind of a gauge and then built on that. So that was kind of the vision. Just a quick, quick one. Okay. Are you going to use this um, uh, the blog just for the outreach and for the promotion of the blog once it's out? Or is this, is this um, I suppose so, but we haven't really figured that out. I suppose if I'm... Idea is welcome. You know, <laughs> yeah, we'll probably post a version of the flyer that you've got with the book cover and the quotes. I'll probably do a little post that has that post, you know, linked up there. Um, and in when I do events that are book talks or book can be cast that way, which I have a couple planned, um, I'll probably mention them. Uh, but uh, and you know, I, I've thought about whether we ought to actually, you know, put the book cover prominently on the blog now. You know, that, that's now, that should now be the image that's front and center, and I think maybe people need to see that when they come to the blog. We'll have to figure out how to do that. Um, but that's as, as far as we've thought of it. Okay. Uh, 
curious what, to what degree, you sort of reached out to existing communities that are interested in the topic of microfinance, but to what degree do you think you actually created a community mm. that was different than what was out there? That's an interesting question. Can you repeat the question? Oh, um, to what degree have I created a new community rather as opposed to just going to existing ones? Um, I would say mostly I went to existing communities. This may be true in most fields. In microfinance, it's a, it's a pretty well-defined and, and self-defined world um, that has lots of different networks and email groups and other kinds of ways that people connect together. And I think it was more about me meshing into that than creating something new. Any last questions? Okay, otherwise I'm going to pass this off to Will really quick. Sure. Hi. Um, just uh, before everyone goes and we wrap this up, we'd just like to remind everybody that uh, David's book is going to be coming out uh, <laughs> little soon. Plug, little plug. <laughs> little plug. Uh, it's going to be reduced, uh, released in the spring. It's called Do January. Do Oh, in January? Yeah. Okay, in January. Uh, it's called Due Gil Diligence. Also, uh, before you go, um, if you're interested in DevCom and joining our network, you can leave a card over there on the table, or you can uh, go to our website, which is... You can just Google Development Communicators Network. And Development right Communicators up. Network. Um, and register there to sign up uh, for all kinds of content. You can also use our Twitter tag, which is pound uh, devcom. And, or uh, you can email us at developmentcommunicators at gmail.com um, and email us with any of your suggestions or questions. Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>